about calibration. I've introduced many of the concepts already. Um, I'd like now to, to discuss some of the specifics in greater detail. And staying still at a high level on account of time. Um, so, I had, early on when I discussed the agent based model in the process, I had noted um, that. So um, I might take issue with that, the diagram that I created there um, a few years back. Um, commonly within our models, we have uh, many sources available for parameter estimates, um, estimates that might um, help alert us to the likelihood of a given transition, say a, a mortality hazard in a given health state, likelihood of, uh, of infection given exposure, that sort of thing. And a variety of types of data include a meta-analysis um, that um, provide data for that. Um, for those who have some interest in this last one, which which I think is a kind of best practice, I would encourage you to take a look at uh, Kristen Hasmer-Lich's thesis from University, from University of Michigan, where she um, quite skillfully makes use of meta-analyses in the TB area to, to estimate some model parameters. Um, we had talked about sensitivity analyses um, as well. Uh, the reflection here is that often we don't have reliable information on some parameters, um, or at least we have broad ranges of uncertainty. And um, we may not have data that allows us specifically to, to, to estimate those in a well-defined way. And yet we want our model to be able to match often a variety of types of data on different sub-pieces of the system. So this is data from here in Saskatchewan associated with end-state renal disease and, and um, diabetic prevalence. And uh, we make this historic data about different sub-pieces of the system on a year-by-year -year basis. And we're trying to build a model which simultaneously matches um, all of these. We'd like it to stay true to all of these. And the reflection is that many of these are things which you can't necessarily use to predict one parameter or another directly. For example, um, ESRD prevalence may depend on a variety of factors, including death rates of ESRD patients, uh, incidence of, of end-stage renal disease. Um, of, among, these are among diabetics, actually. Diabetic-related ESRD, incidence of, of, um, of uh, ESRD among, among diabetics. It, it relates to, therefore, a sort of, it's a more of an emergent uh, aspect of, of system behavior. Um, now there are times where we can use data like this uh, and try to what we what we call back out estimates of different parameters. Uh, in other words, we um, take a piece of data that's influenced by by perhaps a couple of things, and we try to use it to, um, to to figure out what certain parameters must be to to explain it directly. And so we may have a relationship where, for example, we have um, some information on, on the marginals um, associated with the population, so breakdown of the population by sex. We have population-wide prevalence of diabetes and prevalence rate ratio. And we want to figure out what is the sex-specific prevalence from these data, knowing that there's a clear algebraic relationship among them. And this backing up process is quite common in modeling. But in many cases, we instead have data that is a complex combination of a variety of factors. And what we instead will want to do is to tune the model so it will best reproduce that data, best um, match that historic data. And often it's many times as many data points. Um, and really we're asking this question, what, what must less known parameters be as in terms of their values to explain simultaneously all these different and um, sometimes, and this is one of the most important aspects of calibration, sometimes we learn that our model structure just cannot produce the observed patterns, that, that the structure itself is inadequate for accounting for the observed patterns of data. And um, in those cases, we have to go back and reconsider our model structure. This happens very frequently. This happens maybe about half the time for me. I find it just can't happen. And ladies and gentlemen, that is a very good thing. 
This is where a tremendous amount of learning takes place in modeling. Basically, it keeps you honest. It would be a worrisome thing indeed if any model we built, we posited, oh, this is the way the world works, and if we could fit any old model to the data with enough tweak in the parameters, that would be a very, a very grim thing indeed. That would be a very uh, worrisome thing indeed because it would allow us, it would, it would, it would mean that data doesn't really ground us, doesn't really keep us honest. Um, and um, uh, Jeff has a wonderful quote about science being um, the process that keeps us honest. Um, and who, who was it? Was the source of that? And, and maybe you could uh, give the quote again. historically. And so this is where we learn. This is where we, we um, reflect. We try challenging the scope of the model, the limits of the model, try challenging some of our assumptions, and we evolve our hypotheses. And that is a good thing.
question here is that this C number of, of people contacted per unit time is um, is, is, is supposed to be the mean contacts per unit time that a susceptible will have with, with other people. Um, and this C actually is a, um, like if you look at real networks um, and network where there's header bay, some people have more people, some people have more contacts, some people have less. What this actually builds into it, it's actually not just the mean number, that, that only, that's only uh, a fair statement if, if there's really no variation among people in terms of the number of contacts uh, per unit of time that they have. It's actually uh, the mean number, and um, I'm going to have to be careful about this. Um, I think it's, it's the mean times 1 plus the, uh, the variance over the variance over mu squared. Um, it, it's, it's a relationship like that. You can find my slides online. My system dynamics version of the course where I, where I talk about this. But basically, th there's a ratio between the the, um, the variability, um, if this is the standard deviation, in, in contact rates versus the mean contact rate. And, um, and basically, therefore, this, what seems to be a single term, actually builds in assumptions about variation. Some of these other terms, when you calibrate a model, this this will be calibrated to this thing. Okay, it'll be calibrated actually to this thing, not just to the mean. Okay, um, and and similarly, if you have some odd network structure, um, odd. If you have a, if you have a network structure that's like typically well that's that's got elements of scale-free networks and for human human contact patterns, say sexual contact patterns, where these things are are, are well understood. Um, you will have actually C building in um, a, a reflection essentially of that network structure in terms of its impact on this variability and so on. So what I'm saying is when you have an aggregate model, folks, um, you, may, you may be thinking that a parameter represents X, but what it really represents implicitly is not just X, but a combination of other factors that are omitted explicitly from the model. It implicitly captures things that are omitted from the scope of the model um, when you calibrate it to, to real world data. So that calibrated value, you may think, oh, that's a calibrated value of contacts for mean contacts per unit time. Not just that. It's a calibrated value <coughs> to a lot of other factors left out, like the variability in contacts per unit time. And so that value may look suspicious to you, but it's because you haven't explicitly taken into account some other factors. Now, if you build an ancient face model, characterizing it at a more detailed level, where it does have variability in contact and you have network structure, you're, there's fewer, fewer explicit, gross explicit factors that are being omitted from the model. So your calibrated values actually may be more accurate in that case to actual, to, to what you intend them to represent. Um, so in short, when you calibrate a model, Sometimes parameters represent implicitly things that are left out of the model, and that bites us a lot in an aggregate modeling context because our models, uh, the scope of our models is such as we, we sort of um, explicitly excluded or ignored uh, a variety of factors that are in fact relevant for the behavior. Um, so so you, this is one way you have to be a little bit cautious about calibration with the aggregate models. And an agent-based level, Fortunately, that bites us somewhat less because the factors we leave out are less grossly <coughs> affected. But like Dylan said yesterday, um, or was asking about, for example, network dynamics. Um, network dynamics are unlikely to be like moment-to-moment like -moment network dynamics in the course of a day. Your contact patterns unlikely to be really, really important for the spread of, of TB um, because it's a more slow spreading uh, condition and uh, has a very, very long latency period, et cetera. Um, but for a disease like Ebola or, or um, a common cold or flu, um, our, our evidence suggests uh, that at least for flu, 
So there was a question though? Um, oh, yeah, I'm yeah. struggling with this idea between estimation, calibration, and yeah. potential parameter bias between the mm -hmm. like fixing some and estimating others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think you cleared it up. Okay, hope hope that was uh, useful. I mean, this is still something which, you know, I muse quite a lot about and um, I haven't found very good very good uh, discussion in the literature on issues with calibrating um, calibrating systems models. Um, I mean, there's no question there's some papers, but I think it's an area where um, there's actually still a lot of, of um, work going on to um, on how to do this most effectively, et cetera. Um, okay, we're going to have to go super short on, on um, this front. A bit of the how in calibration. Calibration uses a global optimization algorithm. Um, to try to adjust unknown parameters so it automatically rep, um, matches an arbitrary large set of data. Um, uh, and the data, you could think of it as forming constraints on the calibration. The more data you bring to bear to constrain the interpretations, <coughs> the more parameters you can calibrate over effectively. If you have too little data, one data point, two data points, you'll typically find that there's many possible combinations of parameter values that will explain that data. And you're kind of under constrained. It's kind of um, an underdetermined system, to use the language of engineering. Um, uh, and you can end up overfitting. You don't have enough constraints to sort of keep your parameters, um, uh, keep your parameters, um, you know, within um, within bounds enforced by sort of the model structure. You know, constrained highly by that. Um, but if, if we have lots of data that we can bring to bear. We can. We have the luxury of adding more parameters. Uh, a lot of a lot of my students and myself have spent spent a lot of time calibrating models. We really care about this process, and there's there's an art to it and a methodology to it. And we unfortunately don't have time to go into this in great detail. If anyone's interested in talking in considerable detail about some of the approaches we use, I'd be glad to talk about it. <coughs> so, what do you have to specify for calibration? Um, you have to specify a couple of things. First of all, what are you trying to match? Um, and and, uh, and, and uh, specifically, sort of what, how do you judge goodness of fit? And depending on the, the language um, you know, of the, the community you're coming from, you could, we talk about energy functions or penalty functions or error functions that specify how far off we are. That's not an error function in a statistical sense. It's an error function in the sense of discrepancy uh, a, a sort of function that gives you a measure of how bad your fit is. Um, some people speak about payoff functions, especially the goodness of fit. Um, really, that's just one is minus the other. Um, what parameters do you want to vary? And then what optimization algorithm do you want to use? So here we're exploring some parameter space. So per, you know, calibration is exploring the space and trying to find regions of this space or particular sets of parameter values that, that elicit particularly good fits. Um, so, so um, here, for each point of historical data, we're going to calculate a discrepancy between what the model would predict for that versus what's actually observed. And we sum up those discrepancies. Okay? That's, uh, that's kind of the idea. And, and I've done some, some uh, writing on this, on uh, characteristics of a desirable discrepancy metric. And, and there's a variety of, of, of technical reasons we, we like one that, that has some some good uh, good properties associated with it. And this is one suggestion for, for one. Basically, you have a historic value, some model predicted value, divide by the, if these are non-negative, you can divide it by the, the, the mean of the two, the average of the two, and you square it to make it concave. So it prefers two small errors rather than matching one thing exactly and having a big error for the other one. And, and you can have a weight in front of it to weight the importance of the statistical reliability of that particular data. Um, uh, okay, so, so there's a variety of packages out there that support global optimization for calibration. AnyLogic fortunately has a, um, I think it makes, I'm, I'm not sure about this, but uh, it may be the simplex algorithm makes use of, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a solid global optimization algorithm um, in the OpQuest package, yeah, Jeff. Thanks. And 
And the, the actual package that's associated with this is OptQuest, I think, um, which is, I think, a th is that a third party uh, yeah, package yeah. they've contracted? Okay. Okay, thanks. That, that's very, very helpful. Um, and this is less, um, this is more robust than some packages you know, out there. For example, um, BenSim has a simple uh, hill climbing sort of type algorithm where it picks an initial point and it just gets to the highest point and then it'll start again looking for a better one, which is really quite uh, primitive by, by today's standards. Um, okay, so uh, in these slides, I walk you through SAR agent-based calibration and how it does that. I don't have time to go through this in great detail, but suffice it to say that within this model, um, what you'll be able to do is see how you can specify within the experiment, the, the calibration experiment, you can specify what parameters to vary and over what range you're comfortable with them varying. You can tell it to stop after a fixed number of iterations or after an automatic stop based on statistical reliability assessment. And you could specify an objective function um, that, that specifies the discrepancy metric. In other words, um, how do you judge the goodness of fit of, for a given here set data set in this case, it's using a data set of historic data and a data set of data, of data from the model. And it, and it uses this, this function here for this particular model, which is a um, Euclidean um, distance type of, of metric. Um, you, can, you can define your own um, if, if you see fit, because you could specify this objective. And you can say whether you maximize it or minimize it, whether you consider it a, a payoff function or a penalty function, an error function. Okay. And you can go look up sort of um, some of these built-in ones like, like difference if you wish to make use of them or to consider that. So here's a, a custom difference function that, that we defined. Now I have a quite articulated example with this that, that I'm told by my students from MIT really help them understand this process much, much better, what's really going on in optimization. And I'd encourage anyone here who's very interested in this to undertake that. It's a combination of a step-by-step -step process with something that requires you to, to, um, uh, to innovate a, a little bit. Um, uh, and, and in this case, they're using a payoff that's non-analytic. It's using the abs function, which has some, some undesirable properties for it sometimes. Um, now, in this model, they actually capture historic data using what's called a table function. This is a function in any logic in the sense that you can use it to call it on some parameter or return it. Um, uh, and in this case, it can be defined graphically. In fact, you could paste these in, things in from, um, uh, from, uh, from Excel. You can paste in a sheet of, uh, to sort of look up and from your clipboard, in other words, and um, it can define a lookup. And so for a given time, what's the value? A given time, what's the value? And it can perform interpolation on it in a couple of different ways. So this is a way of incorporating uh, data, a, a, a function essentially defined um, numerically. Okay. Um, uh, now, the way this works is similar to what we talked about yesterday. Um, so some of the discussion I had here with Diane in response to Diana's question. Um, the idea is after a simulation um, uh, runs, what we need to do is, excuse me, so initially we, we fill in historic data. Before each simulation run, we uh, reset data on, um, so before each experiment, we reset data on what's the, the, the best uh, match. And then after each simulation run, we salvage the data, just like we did yesterday, from the uh, main class, this root.ds infectious, and we save it away, sort of the results of that simulation, and we see if it's the best iteration. If so, we save it away as the best one thus far in terms of its scoring. In this little example, SIR, agent-based agent SIR model, uh, excuse me, SIR agent-based calibration, will show you how this process is going on to report the best fit, okay? Um, so uh, I believe I have this open some here, and while we don't have time to go into this in all the, the detail I'd like, let's just sort of reflect on this as it's running. So here we're running the calibration component of it. And if we call this up and we say run calibration, what we will see is 
it's trying to do oh oh look at that um oh great um data item okay so i must have made a, a a change yesterday let me reload that sorry folks i maybe i changed it to run um to run more or something like that, that that's a a very curious thing um okay let me close this reopen it boom no okay um okay example models and then SAR agent based calibration here boom okay okay um we'll run this um it's under uh, again under calibration here and we do run and um, what it will be showing here is okay this is it's attempting various matches with blue and it's showing the best one thus far with red and this shows the success um, the best success it's achieved thus far you'll notice that it's tried various things that are not yet advancing and so it's exploring the space, not always going in a direction that improves it, but it's using a quite sophisticated algorithm such that it simultaneously, it doesn't get stuck in the, the best it happens to have found thus far sort of locally. Instead, even if it gets to the best place it could find locally, it'll sort of break out, get worse for a while because it's hoping to get to an even better place. It's kind of like being stuck in a mountain lake. Um, Benson's algorithm, for example, will get you stuck in a mountain lake and you're stuck at the bottom of the mountain lake in the muck, and um, then it will have you start again and look for a better place. This actually will say, okay, well, we found this mountain lake, we'll record it, but let's go look for a better place. So we'll kind of go out and look around, and oh, okay, we can go down here and keep on going down. And so it explores some. And you'll notice it's getting closer and closer. It's trying lots of things that are not so fruitful, but occasionally finds one that is. And um, it does so in a Okay, so, um, so we can further specify what are called optimization constraints, which are tests on the legitimacy, uh, legitimacy of parameter values. For example, if we don't want it to, to adopt parameter values that are negative for something, for infection rate, we can, we can indicate it here. More, more realistically, we can indicate that with the range to be used for the parameter. But here we might be able to have an ad hoc test that looks at the consistency of a set of parameters with each other and, and nixes it, vetoes it, before, before evaluating the results if they are not acceptable. Um, yeah. The, these ones here? Yeah. yeah. And, and those three, it says one is historical data, which I assume is where comparing. That's correct, yeah. And then it says the best output. That's right. And that's the yellow one. No, that's the, the red one. Oh, the red one, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, but they never, they never agree in, at the end. However, they do agree in between. So I'm not sure. Okay, so. so the one and one is okay, so, so they're agreeing extremely closely right here right now um, uh, so th they're right overlapped right now um, and and you'll notice it's 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 found quite a quite a good fit there um, <coughs> so I'm not um, well I mean it, it you know where you end up is, is somewhat dependent on that but but it's gonna find a pretty good match um, in any case um, hmm. Yeah, why does it bypass? Why doesn't it just stop if it's overlaying the question? Well, it, it's still got slight discrepancies here, so it's searching for... I think you can do absolutely better. Yeah, so yeah. The right. Now, now, again, you can have it stop after a fixed number of iterations, or you could have it... You could have it... Um, 
stop um, stop when a, a certain level of, of um, accuracy is produced in the parameter estimates. Yeah. Um, so so you can specify tests on legitimacy parameter values or on the validity of emergent results. For example, let's suppose that it makes your number of people in the population go, you know, um, 90 per more than 50 percent of the population are you're believed to have been infected, you know, to best match this data at one point. You know that there's no way it can be above a certain level. You can nix that. Um, and then, as I said yesterday, you could enable multiple replications for a given, for a given um, experiment. So essentially, it can run many, many times for a given set of parameter values to try to get an estimate. And I, I have some, some discussions of, um, some of some of the um, the statistics associated with estimating the sample mean, and it uses these estimates of the sample mean and can stop when the estimates of the sample mean um, some error bars around it lie within within a certain fraction of the um, of the uh, sample mean. Okay, there's there's detailed discussion of this in my YouTube videos on the on the subject, so you you can find that. Um, yeah, sure. It depends. So, so there's it, any logic imposes no explicit maximum. You can try fitting as many as you want, but um, it was before you got here. But uh, we had some discussion of um, of the trade-offs involved between I think it was before. I'm, I may be wrong. Between um, how much data you have available to you right. on the one hand and the number of of uh, parameters you're trying to fit. If you have recourse to a lot of data to constrain them. Generally speaking, you could do, you could examine more parameters, but there is a point at which the size of the space alone. Can you have different kinds of data, or is this like, can you say more data between longer time series or no. things? Or can you have more different, different types of? Absolutely. More different, um, so, so you might have some data on prevalence, some data on incidence, some data on um, number of, of deaths, you might have data on the number of emergency room reports, you might have data on, you know, uh, lots and lots of extra factors, and normally your discrepancy function, um, what's shown here is kind of difference, will take into account the s systematic discrepancies across uh, all data points. Uh, uh, you know, another best practice is if you could have this difference function weighting um, each of those sources according to their statistical reliability or some other measure. Um, that so you're not, you know, if if you have uh, low incidence associated with this thing, even if you have high prevalence. Um, fairly high prevalence. If you have low incidence and you get, you know, two, three, two, one, zero um, reports per month or, or you know, per, per week, um, those going to have a lot of sample error associated with it. And it'll be good to try to, you know, reflect that in the discrepancy metric. Um, so um, I have writing on that separately, and, and there's some well defined ways you can do that. Um, Based on statistical principles, um, uh, so so I, I make some modifications um, for how you can report results for each realization, and uh, basically you can run many many realizations for a given set of parameter values. So for a given point in parameter space, a given assumption about the parameters, runs many realizations, so it gets it, it really tests that out um, so that the vagaries of make that space, that exploration of parameter space less noisy, essentially. And so it will settle down at a, it won't dismiss a really good set of parameter assumptions just because it was unlucky in, in getting sort of a, uh, a set of random number seeds that, that meant it didn't match in that particular realization the historic data very well. Mm. So, so you can regularly do that. And I, I give some explanations for things that are otherwise kind of underexplained. Um, on sort of where this payoff value comes from when you have multiple multiple realizations, et cetera. So you can follow this online very, very closely. Um, okay, so adding constraints helps increase identifiability. Adding more data, um, uh, adding parameters to tune leads to a larger space to explore. Adding too many parameters to tune can lead to an underdetermined situation if you don't have the requisite data to, to match them, and can just lead to exploration without limit once the space is too large. And all fits are within the constraints of the model. And that little exercise I've asked you to do 
tries tries a little example um, where we try to match a model structure against historic data, mm -hmm. and um, and hopefully you should be able to arrive at a really good estimate from this parameterization. But then I ask you to modify the model structure slightly. So imagine if you were trying to match a, a model structure that had errors and trying to trying to calibrate it against that data. How well do you do? And it comes up with a different source of a set of parameter estimates, um, you know, which which are not well founded. So um, this is, or shall I say, it it it. It doesn't alert you in that particular case to the problem in model structure, um, uh, or at least not so well. Um, okay, um, so it turns out there's there's an art in dealing with calibration problems, and I've spent a lot of my time doing this and helping students with it. If calibration is encountering problems, there's something to be learned from that, and you can you can actually try to figure out what those problems are and collect data to deal with them. Um, Augment your data, um, enhance the um, uh, the ranges over which you're looking for parameters or change the model structure even in some cases to, to, to account for what it's finding. It gets confused about certain things. It may it, it may not have a unique answer because it has two different interpretations, and there's ways to, to find this out. Um, if if you think it's getting a really bad calibration, see if you can do better yourself. This is one of the best ways to look. Okay, I think I can I can do better calibration. I'm going to adjust these parameters in this way. And try to get a feel for what goes wrong when you try to do that. Because often when you do that, you get something unexpected. It's like, oh, when I when I get close, this other thing gets worse, and you didn't see that previously. And that gives you a sense of what it's trying to what what the challenge with the calibration is. That um, you know the sort of tensions it feels during calibration. It, it can be a very effective learning opportunity for yourself. Um, how do you deal with uh, calibration problems? Well, the most important thing is to enhance your understanding, but you know there are ways to, to, to sort of loosen the restrictions by increasing parameter range or number of parameters. You can examine the impact of change model structure, add, add in components that you weren't sure needed to be included to examine run for a larger number of optimization runs, find other estimates for uncertain parameters. Um, and you want to check if, if the calibrated values are unique. If you run this many times, do you get the same set of, of you know, very close uh, sets of parameter estimates? Um, yes? Uh, yep. go back a, a couple um, a couple slides um, in, in um, uh, I, I actually have a slide which which um, comments on this okay so so basically it's going to do a run a, a given run of the model um, and for, for a given realization and um, it's going to get some statistics that are those statistics that are accumulated in the run, in this particular little example, if the DF factors, which is the data set stored in the number of factors in a different class, but there could be a data set storing the infectious and first nations subdivisions or infectious 
number of these realizations for a given set of parameter values, um, we um, uh, this is the best iteration. This is the best. This is where gets me. This is the best simulation using that threefold division I talked about yesterday. This is the best result for a, for a given set of parameter values. Um, it's, it, or it, it sees if it is. So this is kind of after we're done with all the the specific specific realizations for that set of particular set of parameter values. In other words, after we're done with just running it kind of uh, with different random number seeds for a given assumption about parameters, we then check, okay, given the mean for all and match for all of those, is this the best? If so, we save this thing here away in the best, okay? And so we save away for each of those, like, what's the, um, uh, what's, well, okay, this is just because it, it needs to be displayed. Actually, um, it remembers, um, it remembers what's the, the best uh, iteration, and um, I think it, it uses that later to sort of, uh, but, okay, so this, sorry, I'm getting I'm now mixed up with just explaining what's going on. Really, for your sake, what you would care about is that it needs to save away this data so it can it can uh, get these these results saved away here. And then secondly, you would need to have your difference function. Um, and I have a uh, I have a uh, uh, sort of uh, illustration of this. You need your difference function here. Instead of just comparing, um, and your, your functional form might be different than this, but instead of just comparing each point within DS infectious current, what it would instead do is it would add it up. See this diff here, and it does diff plus equal sat. What that's doing is it's it's accumulating a discrepancy across each point of this DS infectious current. In other words, each point of, of the time series it does have. So you'd be doing, you'd go and you basically have a bunch of code here for for the prevalence among first nations, the prevalence among school kids, for the number of emergency room reports or whatever. Um, you'd be computing the discrepancies for every one of those data points, just adding them to this here. And then it would return them. And, and that's all you need to do. The key thing is this DS infectious current, that was the thing we salvaged. And so you need to have salvaged that before, and, did, and, and that's really all that's needed to be done. Now this uses a, um, this is a custom one. You could actually do it even more easily if, if you're willing to use a Euclidean distance, which which uh, might be a really good idea. You could use this difference function here and just make it difference of these two data sets, the historic for infectious versus the, the one recorded. And you would have difference of, you know, um, model A and historic A. Um, sorry, just the, the difference of that, call that function, compute that here, plus difference of model B and historic B, there, plus difference of model C and historic C, et cetera. Does that make sense? No. And so basically it would just be, rather than writing a custom function, you could actually just sort of string things together, plus, 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 this difference, that difference, and, and, and some of those might be in those model A, you know, historic A might, in one case, might be school kid prevalence, um, and, 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 you know, model school kid prevalence and historic school kid prevalence, and then model first nation prevalence, um, sort of model uh, school kid incidents and historic incidents. Does that make sense? It would just be plusing them together. Okay? Okay. Okay. Great question. Oh, great. Um, okay. Um, so, um, right. Um, okay. Um, uh, yeah. So, so there's a set of other, um, a set of other sort of comments I, I have here, which, um, uh, which are worth uh, reflecting on where you find me uh, commenting online on, on these as well. Um, uh, you, you want to be suspicious about calibrated parameters that are at the edge of their legal values. <laughs> That probably mean it would have even gotten better had it gone beyond that edge. In which case, um, you've got to be asking, okay, is that edge 
is that limit you provide when I say edge I mean the limit you provided to it is that well founded uh, why is it getting better enhancing your intuition here your your understanding of of, of why this is good or, or bad is is very helpful um, and to deal with those at the at the edge you can sometimes relax constraints but collect more data on plausible values question the model structure often um, uh, sometimes um, right if we want parameter B to be adjusted to be at least as big as parameter A or you know the ratio between them to be to fall within a certain range um, we may need to uh, do that in one of two places either we could actually calibrate the ratio and have the minimum of it be A or we could um, nix it if B is, is um, less than A in which case we'll try to explore it and nix it. It would be better to do the ratio if you do adjust the ratio if you can. So there's some sometimes you want B and A are two parameters you're adjusting but they're not independent you, you know what you actually you do want B's value is posited to, to depend in some way on A. And so um, if you can capture those through coefficients that are ratios or what have you, it's best. Um, okay. Um, right. So well, I have some comments here and sort of um, some very naive comments on some differences from regression, where, you know, in a lot of regression characteristics, we have some functional form um, that we're trying to regress. Um, you know, so we have a, a, a form associated with a, a logistic regression that we impose. In a simulation model, the behavior is only implicitly specified. This is given via differentials. In, in the case of agent-based models, it's given with state charts and other components. Model output is a complex, emergent property of structure. And so here, we're, in, a, in a way, it's a little bit like regression in the sense that it's kind of curve-fitting, but we're doing it with a functional form that's not specified that emerges from a model operation, and we're trying to, to match that. Um, could you argue it's a form of nonlinear regression? Yeah, may, maybe it is, um, but I, I can't speak to that with, with complete authority. Um, okay, so those are some comments of calibration. Any questions about that before we, um, we go and uh, break for, um, do a health break, and then uh, I think what we'll do Given the time, is to um, is to do discrete event modeling really quickly because there seems to be a lot of interest in that, and and we'll have the extra Java tutorial um, tagged on at the so we'll just go through essentially y yesterday's Java tutorials and and onward and and um, and then the new ones uh, today starting at one o'clock, okay, um, uh, and and basically instead of the building a hierarchical ABM. Um, we will we will have something else today, but we'll go well two hours of, of Java tutorials this afternoon, which will cover yesterday's and today's the material originally scheduled for today. So, any questions on calibration? I apologize for going through that so quickly. It's a it's a big uh, topic unto itself.
Yes, I'm working towards this. Well, you're not going to take care of somebody. Well, I'm just going to offer a minute. If you're looking for something that could maybe help you with your mental health issues, you might want to
part of an ecosystem. It's not merely a you know thing you publish and, and contribute in that way and, and then you move on. If it's something where you're working with people who collect the data, you're working with the people who can help formulate interventions, even in very small pilot interventions, that can also be a way of really keeping yourself honest because you you explicitly, prospectively sort of uh, predict certain things and then you collect the requisite data and form the intervention and you see how well your model did. And that, that will really um, help ground what you're doing in a big way and help ground your hypothesis. So, so um, a lot of our models were fortunate enough here to, to be in that sort of situation um, and we, we through one means or another can can help shape things a little bit, and um, that's that's a good thing. Good thing. Okay, so why don't we um, break for a little bit? People want to break? Yes. Okay. Okay. So why don't we why don't we have a break for um, for ten minutes, and then, and then we can um, rejoin here. Thanks. Can I ask you two, three questions. Sure. Uh, you in? Yeah, Venice, just there. Oh, there. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. 